Hey, I'm in the middle of a series, and this series is just simply called The Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm preaching on this series, coming out of a series on words. So they're sort of connected. And I get asked all the time by, by young pastors and even by young people on our staff, they say, Norm, you've been serving the Lord for 30 plus years, and we've seen others fall off. We see others have inconsistencies. Could you please tell us the, the secret to your consistency? in the ministry and consistency in serving the Lord. And what I'm going to share, first of all, when I hear them say that, here's what I hear them say. Why are you so boring? When they say, tell me why you're so consistent. I hear, why are you so boring? You know, and, uh, but, but the honestly is, I'm going to share with you what I consider my secret to being consistent all these years. That's what this series is about. It's based out of a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20. He said, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. You know, for a lot of people, their relationship with the Lord is just a lot of talk. It's just a lot of beliefs, and it's about church membership, and it's just about reading the Bible only. And, and, and those are all good things, having a good set of beliefs, reading your Bible, uh, being a part of a church, going through growth. All of that's good. But he said, hey, there's more. He said, it's not just a lot of talk. It's not just a lot of beliefs. It's not just a set of a system, a structure around you. It's living by God's power. That's what God, he wants you to live by his power. We came out of this series and on words. And for a lot of people, we laughed, we cried, we were challenged. And we, there was a verse in there that we read. And in James chapter three, it says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. You can train elephants, you can train dogs, you can train tigers and lions and even uh, dolphins, porpoises, you can do all that. But no human being can tame, can tame the tongue. Now, I don't know, when I read a verse like that, I get a little bit discouraged. Like, God wants me to control it, but he says, I can't control it. And, and we can fill in the blank here. No human being can tame your temper. We could tame bad habits, greed, our lust, our gossip, whatever temper, whatever your, whatever your issue is. It's like, I can't do it. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And here's my thought. You can't tame it, but with God, But with the help of God, you can. And that's why Jesus, just before he left, the last sentence he made, he lived on this earth for 33 and a half years, died, came back for 40 more days. And the very last sentence he made was this in Acts chapter one and verse eight. He said, hey guys, don't try to do Christianity without this. He says, but you shall receive power after the whole, you'll get a little bit of help after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Well, he made that statement because you're going to need some help to do this thing called Christianity. Well, then we go back to the early church. That was in Acts chapter one. Acts chapter two was the birth of the church. And here we go, 28 years later, after Jesus made that statement in the day of Pentecost, and in Acts chapter 19, Paul was at Corinth, where we get the letter to the church of Corinthians. Paul took a road, took the road through the interior, and he arrived at Ephesus, where another church was. It's where we get the book of Ephesians. And there he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I think that's a lot of Christians today. Well, we like God the Father, We like the love of God. We like Jesus the Son, but we don't even know anything about the Holy Spirit. Or if you were like I was when I first got saved, you saw some things on Christian television that you can't unsee. And you go, if that's the Holy Spirit, I'm not sure I want that. And so even even in the early church, there was this battle, this epic battle going on for some clarity on the role of the Holy Spirit. And here's what the Bible's trying to communicate to you in this, and I'm going to do do this today. If you don't have the role of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to be irritated. You're going to be conflicted. You're going to be mean. You're going to find that you can't do Christianity without some help. You're going to be judgmental. You're going to be harsh. Don't raise your hand, but already there's a vision of someone in your mind who's just a mean Christian. And they're just trying to do it all by talk and not with a little bit of God's help. Let me say to you, 
If you love East Coast Believers Church, if you love what occurs in here, the amount of people that get saved and the amount of marriages that get restored and the amount of people that find freedom and the young people that we're touching a generation, if you love what's happening here, let me give you a secret. The secret isn't, isn't in my good communication. It's not in production value. It's not in programming. It's not in music. Here's the secret of it all. If you want the inside secret sauce of our church, here it is, the presence of God. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was getting ready to exit. He's getting ready to leave. And he's telling the disciples, hey, I'm getting ready to die. And they didn't like it. And here's the, here's the condensed version of his last 12 hours on this earth. It's found in John 14, 15, and 16. And at the very end, he introduces the Holy Spirit to them. And, he, and they said, you, he said, instead you grieve because of what I told you. They're like, we don't want you to leave Jesus. We need you, Jesus. I know what they were thinking. They're thinking if Jesus leaves and this Holy Spirit comes, I mean, who's going to protect us? Who's going to help us when we're in the boat, in the storms? I mean, who's going to stand up and say, peace, be still? It's not going to be you, Peter. You tried that once, you sank. Who's going to feed the 5,000? Who's going to do that? Who's gonna, what, what happens when the woman with the issue of blood comes? Who's going to handle that moment? Who's going to handle the moment when the Pharisees challenge us? I mean, which one of us? We're fishermen, tax collectors. Who's going to stand up and tell the Pharisees? I mean, the things that you're preaching are robbing us of God's power. We can't do that. So you're grieving. Jesus responds and goes, but in fact, it is best for you. Here's what I'm saying. A lot of us are like, I don't want the Holy Spirit. I want God. I want Jesus. And he's saying, you know what's best for you? It's the Holy Spirit that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And he said, I want to send the Holy Spirit to you. What's that look like? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does it look like? John 14, same topic. He said, I will ask the Father, and this is the introduction of it, And he will give you another counselor to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. And notice what it says here. But you know him and here it is. For he lives with you and he wants to be in you. In other words, you're never, if you can get the Holy Spirit in you, and with you, you're never alone. I call him, he's your ride along buddy. He's the guy riding shotgun with you. He's the guy everywhere you go, he goes. Jesus is trying to communicate something to them that we know. Jesus was limited by a body. He can only be in one place at one time. And they saw him do all these incredible things. He said, but there's coming a day where the Holy Spirit wants to be your best friend. He wants to be this guy that goes with you everywhere you go and everything you do in your good days and your bad days and your high moments and your low moments and the moments where you want to quit and the moments that you're excited about the future. He said, I will be in you and I want to be with you. Here's what he was trying to to communicate. What Jesus was to the 12 disciples is what the Holy Spirit is to the church. Go back. You, I don't know. You go read the gospels. You go find your favorite gospel story. I don't know what your favorite story is. Pick out your stories. The woman caught in the act of adultery. Is it Jesus with the woman at the well? Is it when he fed the 5,000? Is it when he, he said to the storm, peace, be still? Is it when he spoke in parables? I don't know. Whatever your story is that you like, here's what the Bible says. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to be to you in your life. Because he wants to be with you and in you. Now, we get, a lot of us get freaked out about the Holy Spirit. A lot of us don't understand the Holy Spirit. We, we don't even like the word Spirit. It's Holy Spirit. In fact, when they were translating this word in the Greek, this word is the Greek word pneuma. 
And they had such a hard time translating it. So this, it's the third person of the Godhead. See, for a lot of Christians in church today, we've just made the Holy Spirit be like, like about a dove or about oil or about water or, or, or about clouds. And I need to tell you something. Those might symbolize the Holy Spirit, but they, those are not the Holy Spirit. Don't let the symbols minimize the Holy Spirit. It's just like the bread and the juice. They represent the broken body and the shed blood. Those are symbols, but they are not the body and the blood. Don't let juice and don't let bread minimize the sacrifice that Jesus made. Please don't let a dove minimize the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. So, so they said, well, how do we translate this word spirit? Because it's the word pneuma. And in, in, in the actual in the Greek dictionary, if you're to go look this up, it just means breath. It's like holy breath. Another translation, wind. Another translation means a current. And why is, why is this so important? Because a lot of us need a fresh wind in our life. We just need some fresh wind. See, you know when you're working out and, and you're lifting weights and you're trying to gasp your breath or you're, you're climbing a high mountain and you're going to a higher altitude. I mean, you just need some, a little bit of help. You need a little bit of oxygen. Here's what I'm trying to say to you is this. The Holy Spirit is oxygen in the kingdom of God for a believer. The Holy Spirit is not just to be studied. He's not just to be explained. He's to be experienced. I know, like in moments like this, I'm always trying to unpack and teach and I've taught on the, the Trinity and who the Holy Spirit is and we talk about like, like an egg and the shell and the yolk and the white and all that. I don't want to do that because the Holy Spirit is not, again, he's not a symbol. He's the third person of the Godhead. He's a person. Now, let me give you some theology. If you like theology for these next seven or eight minutes, I'm going to give you some theology, really, because the question comes up, who is God? And what does the Bible say about who God is? And I want to give you the three main points for, for your theology. If you, people ask you, who is God? Number one, God is just one. What does that mean? That means you're a monotheist. And what that means is you believe there is one God and one God only. He's the God who created the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. He's the creator. God's just one. And it says in Deuteronomy chapter six, it said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This means there's no other gods. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He's just simply saying this. There might be a lot of little G gods, gods that you've created, be it your career, be it love of money, be a, be a, be a boyfriend, our girlfriend, our relationship. They might have that place in your life, but there's only one God. In fact, parenthetically, I'll speak to this, and then this isn't part of this God is one theology, monotheist, but then God adds something else in there. He says, hey, not only is there one God, I want to be the only God, the first place in your life. He's what he's saying is, in Exodus 20, he said, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. In other words, you can have a long list of things you like, and God's okay with it. You can love your career, God's okay with that. You can love your family, God's okay with that. In fact, God wants that. You can love money, God's okay with that. You can have money, you can have, you can have all of these things that you want to acquire, homes and stuff. Here's what he's saying. Have all those things, but just make sure I'm number one. He said, you can have a long list of things that you want to do. Just make sure I'm on the top of your list. So God is one. Number two is God is eternal. All that, this is a hard one for us. That means with God, there's no beginning and there's no end. All that simply means is God always was and God always will be. It says in Genesis chapter one, it said the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the earth. And then God said, let there be. John chapter one, it says in verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and nothing was made that was made without him. All that means is God always was and God always will be. I know you're like me. I can't comprehend that. I can't even understand that. Where did God come from? Here's what I'm trying to say. You can't understand an infinite God with a finite mind. A lot of us want to, but I have to be honest with you, if we could understand everything about God, then he wouldn't be God. He's bigger than our brains. That's what's called faith. But here's the part I wanted to get to. This is what we believe about the doctrine, who is God? This is theology, that God is a trinity. He's one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Second Corinthians 13 spells it out best for us. It says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So God the Father, Jesus the Son, but then the Holy Spirit is not an it, not a thing, not a cloud, not a wind, not a, not a piece, uh, a jar of oil. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The, you can describe it, it can be found described in the book of Matthew when Jesus went to get baptized by John the Baptist. Remember, Jesus the Son was there to be water baptized, and God the Father said, This is my beloved Son, who am I, who I am well pleased. And then it said, Then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And so the reality of is we want to know who is the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you what Jesus said. He was introducing him. And in John chapter 14, he said this, but when the father sends the advocate as my representative, if you're not sure who that is, he says, that's the Holy Spirit. Now notice it doesn't say it. It says he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. He said, I am leaving with you a gift, peace of mind in heart. And the peace I give, it's a gift the world cannot, that the world cannot receive. So don't be troubled or be afraid. And so here's, in case you're afraid of the Holy Spirit, in case you're concerned, like what about the Holy Spirit in my role in my life? Jesus, in his version of teaching about him, he said, it's a gift for you. And I just did a, a quick little study the other day. I thought, well, all the things that talks about who the Spirit of the Holy Spirit is in the New Testament alone. This is not an exhaustive list, but here's what it says. Hey, he, number one, he, he wants to be your helper. How many would like a helper in your life? You can use a little bit of help occasionally. It says he wants to be a, a comforter. I mean, goodness gracious, we just need comfort sometimes in our life. It says he's the, the Holy One. We're struggling with holiness. We want to get it right. Well, he's the spirit of the Holy One. He's the spirit of counsel. How many could just use some, just some help, some wisdom from God? He's the spirit of wisdom. He's the spirit of understanding. It's what Dylan was talking about earlier. You can't, you need some help understanding something? Well, the Holy Spirit wants to help you. He's the spirit of might. Gosh, how many could just use some strength in your walk with the Lord? Just strength to walk, do, do, do your walk on this earth. He's the the spirit of truth. Well, I like this one. Because if there's, ever, if there's ever been a generation that needs a spirit of truth, it's this generation right now. Because we got this whole new thought, well, that's just my truth. That's, well, and you know, and I, honestly, what if an engineer said, well, here's my truth. Two plus three equals Nine. We go, no, two plus three equals five. And they go, no, 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 my truth. It, five is your truth, nine's my truth. How many would want to drive over a bridge that engineer designed? Because it's not truth. And you know what we need in the midst of all these things culturally coming out us, at us? Jesus said, I'm going to give you a gift. It's not a spirit, a cloud, a dove, a mist. It's a spirit of truth in your life. He said this, you could have a spirit of holiness just to help you be separate in a world that's ever more trying to crowd in on your, your beliefs and your morals. He said, it'll help you. He said, you could have a, excuse me, a spirit of, of love. Gosh. And the people that are so divided today, wouldn't it be great to get some help? I mean, just forget about politics. Just, just in your home on the job. What if you had a gift that would help you stay in love? I'll take that. I'll take that going down to I4, on I-4 tomorrow. <laughs> How about this? A spirit of a sound mind. How about he wants to be a sound mind? How about a spirit of power? How about this? A spirit of judgment to know what's right, to know what's wrong. How about this? A spirit of life. Come on. Sickness and disease try to take, take you out. Spirit of life. How about a spirit of knowledge? How about this? A spirit of grace. I like this one. How about a spirit of freedom? There was a verse that John Mark read last week, and 
When he read it, I thought, I'm going to preach on that. And here it is. I love this verse because a lot of us want freedom. Because we say, well, you know, I got some things that have been passed down. And my mama did it. And my grandma did it. And her mama did it. And my daddy did it. And my granddaddy did it. And my great great granddaddy did it. And it's just what our family is. And it's just in our family. And we got bad tempers. We got bad mouths. We got divorce. We got grief. We got all these things. Here's what the Bible says. You make room for the Holy Spirit. For the Lord is the Spirit. Spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He says you could have some freedom in your life with the Holy Spirit helping you. So because he's a person, what's our response? I just gave you some theology. But what's our response to this? Because he's a person, we have to develop a dependency on the Holy Spirit. A dependency means I need him in my walk. I need to let you know something. Your Christian faith, it was never designed just to be a set of beliefs. It was never designed just to be a destination that if you could make it through in this earth, if you could just somehow discipline your way through and make it through that one day you could get to heaven. It was never designed for that. It was designed all of these expectations that Jesus puts on us and God puts on us It was all designed to live, to be lived with a little bit of help. A dependency. We talk about like our nation. It came up in the news this yesterday and this morning with the war in the Middle East. How's this gonna affect our nation's oil? That's what I heard. I thought, is that the first thing you can think about when people are dying? And then they said, the commentator said, our nation is dependent on these nations for oil. And here's what I'm saying. We need to live a life that we're dependent on the Holy Spirit to help us get through this thing called Christianity and our walk with the Lord. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter four. I'm just giving you theology. I'll make it real practical in a moment. He said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And so if the Holy Spirit can be grieved, that means the Holy Spirit can be pleased. If the Holy Spirit can be grieved, that means the Holy Spirit can be loved on. And and actually in context here, and when it talks about in Ephesians 4, you can look it up. He's talking about how you talk to one another, how you treat, like how you, how you, how you interact in your marriage, how you interact with your kids, how you interact with your friendships, how you interact on the job. He said, the Holy Spirit can be grieved by how you talk to one another. And then it says in Acts chapter 7, he said, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? So if you can resist the Holy Spirit, then you can welcome the Holy Spirit. And then it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, do not quench the Holy Spirit. He can be quenched. He can be shut out of your life. And so you see all this. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. He can be resisted. Do you know why? Because he's not an it. He's not a thing. Just like Jesus was resisted. Just like Jesus, you know, they just ignored him and and tried to get him out of the city and away from people. The Holy Spirit can be the same thing in your life. That's why Galatians says this, key verse. So I say, let the Holy Spirit, because you have to let him because he won't force you. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Wow, that's a new thought for us. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You won't have to pray the prayers that we've all prayed. Lord, forgive me one more time. I mean it this time. And and I believe everyone's sincere when you pray that prayer. I know I am. And you want to get it right. You don't want to do it again. You're sincere about it and you mean it. And he says, hey, I'll help you out with something. If you would let the Holy Spirit in a little bit more, those, those things that you don't want to do, he'll help you get over those. So what's our response to this? There's a verse in the book of Luke. And again, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. This is a red letter verse. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, he said, if you then, though you are evil, a better translation would be natural, like just a father. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, he's talking about if you're a mom or dad, you want to give your kids a gift. He says, you know how to do that. How much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit Notice this, not force, but give to those who ask him. The reason I put this verse in here, depending upon what your background is, 
depending upon where you're from, theologically and even denominationally, you might have this thought. If I ask for the Holy Spirit, one or two things might happen to me. Number one, he'll turn me into a weird Christian. And if you've ever seen a weird, ever seen a weird Christian that's filled with the Holy Spirit, let me let you in on a little secret. They were weird before the Holy Spirit came. If you ever see a, a strange, odd Christian that has filled with the Holy Spirit, let me help you out with something. They were strange and they were odd before the Holy Spirit came in their life. And in fact, they were probably more strange and more odd and more weird before the Holy Spirit came. But there's a whole other group of people that believe, well, if I ask for the Holy Spirit, maybe he'll give me a demon. I'll open myself up for that. And look what Jesus just said. He said, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, God's going to give you exactly what you ask for. So what's our response to this? That if we ask the Holy Spirit, three thoughts, 10 minutes, here we go. I'm going to make it real practical for you. Our response, because we need this help. Christianity wasn't meant to be lived without the third person of the Godhead. Our prayer should be this. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I just need you in my life. Holy Spirit, come. It's, it's not okay, Holy Spirit, for you to be far away. It's not okay, Holy Spirit, for you not to be involved in my life. You see, if you're married, you'd understand this illustration. Most married couples with children, you're busy. You're going here, she's going to work, you're going to work, you're, cross, you're like ships crossing in the night, you know, you're, you're, you're going this direction, she's going that direction, and just because you don't talk to each other all day long, that doesn't mean you're not married anymore. You, you're still married, but the reality of it is this. There has to be times that when, if you are married, there has to be face-to-face encounters. There has to be moments where you communicate. There has to be moments where you have this just a, even if it's just a few minutes where you just actually connect with one another. And here's the theology of it. The Holy Spirit is always in you, but if you're not making room for him, he can be far away. You have to make room for him. You have to have those moments where you connect. Which leads me to my next thought. You have to make room for the Holy Spirit. And I always think, I put this in there, I thought, this is a new thought for me. And I was thinking, when I was writing this, I thought to myself, if I preached this 20 years ago, I don't think I'd even have to put this thought in here. And if I was preaching 100 years ago, it wouldn't even enter my mind. But here we are living in 2023. And we have a lot of things fighting for room in our lives. We have this little thing this little teeny device, it's so amazing and so dumb at the same time. I have a love-hate relationship with this little device right here. I love it, but then I hate it, because you know why? I love it because it connects me to others. I hate it because it takes time out of my life. And you endlessly scroll, endlessly look at stuff, you know, see stuff always connected, always available. And here's a verse that I want to give you. John chapter three says, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. Here's what it's saying. There has to be less of me in my life and more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I have to just make some room. Less about what I want and here's what I'm asking you to do. What if on the way to work tomorrow, instead of listening to the radio, what if you just turned it off and said, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, I'm gonna make some room for you today. What if when you, we go, you just mindlessly grab your phone? I get it, we all do it. And instead of just looking through it, what if we said, I'm gonna put that down and Holy Spirit, I wanna make room for you today. I want you to come. It's like, if you're a parent like us, being married and having jobs and in our case, having a lot of kids in different age groups, if you wanna connect with them, here's what I found out. You won't connect with them accidentally. You have to make room. You have to design spaces in your life to connect with them. And in my case, you got an 11-year-old boy, a 13, 14-year-old girl, 16-year-old girl, then married kids. They're all different. And you have to make room for them. 
If you don't make room for them, you won't connect with them. And here's what I'm saying. If the Holy Spirit was an it or a mist or a cloud, you wouldn't have to do this. But he's the third person of the Godhead. He said, hey, make some room for me. And I'll say it to you like this. If I, if I get parents ask me about raising kids often, and here's one of the pieces of, of advice I give them. What you do with your kids when they're young, I've learned this, you'll be able to do with them when they're older. If you laugh with them when they're young, you'll laugh with them when they're older. If you invest into them when they're young, you can, they can invest into you when you're older. Let me say it to you. What, the role of the Holy Spirit. What you do with the Holy Spirit in private will set you up for public. You see? I just had a service in here about an hour ago. And someone said yes to Jesus. Not just some, bunches, bunches of people said yes to Jesus. I can't preach good enough to have someone say yes to Jesus. I can't. In fact, I'm so nervous sometimes coming out here. The last thing I do back in my office is take a cup of communion and say, Lord, please, one more time, would you help me? But I can't ever, we can't ever have a bad service. We can't ever have a service where we don't, we're not on because someone has to say yes to Jesus. It's their Sunday. You had your Sunday. They need theirs. So what does that require? It requires myself and a bunch of people to walk through this auditorium saying, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Make room for the Holy Spirit. Let me wrap it up with this. Is you have to yield to the Holy Spirit. The best verse I could think of for this is in Romans 8, verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You have to just yield. And I'm tempted. I'm just a pastor, and so I like to teach. And, and the reason I teach the way I do is because I sat in a church just like you when I first got saved. And I loved God so much. And every word they said, I hung on. And I, I learned a lot about God. I just didn't know how to do it. Like I wanted to, I just didn't know how. And so I always thought to myself, if I would ever pastor, I would want to make sure that people knew how. So I'm, I'm always like looking at it and I'm taking a theology and a formula. I'm always breaking it apart and saying, how do you do this? And the question like comes is, how do you yield? It's like if you have kids, you, and I'm tempted just to give you a formula, but I don't want to give you a formula today. Because the Holy Spirit isn't about a formula. He's a person. If you have kids, you know, you, you tell them, you say, hey, this is what's best for you. And if your kids are anything like my kids, they will tell you why you're wrong. They will tell you how that's the way things used to be in the 1800s, Dad, but not now. If you have kids like mine, they'll tell you, you just don't know everything that I know. You don't see every, and you just want to shake them. (laughs) Grab them. This is my therapy right now. And um, you just want to grab them and say, I know, trust me, I know what's best for you. I see something you don't see. I, I know you think, one of my kids asked me years ago, Daddy, when you were a kid, did they have knives and forks or did you just use hands? I said, I know you think that I'm a caveman, but I know better. And I know a lot of you think the Holy Spirit is outdated, but he knows better. I was working with a pastor once who called me and said, hey, can you help me? As I was talking with him, and I said, well, this is what I, would, I see. And, you know, and they were struggling, and they're a few years behind us. And I said, this is, with all my, this is what I just see. And he goes, well, no, you don't understand. And he just gave me every excuse as to why everything I said just wasn't going to work for him. And I'm a different part of the nation, and, and I have different kinds of people in my church. And, and, and this, is just our, this is just our culture here. And he kept just giving me excuses. I finally said, okay, just do whatever you want to do then. And honestly... I feel like that's what the Holy Spirit would do sometimes. Because he's just a person. It's just like Jesus. Remember he said this? A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown. The very people he loved the most rejected him. If you can reject Jesus, you can reject the Holy Spirit. 
Dean and I lived in Europe. We first got married. We were missionaries. And um, I'm just, she comes from a small town in Pennsylvania called Beaver Falls. And I come from a small town in Florida called Port Orange. It's just about an hour from here. And back where I grew up in the 80s, it was even much smaller than it is now. So we moved to Paris. Large city. It's new to us. We had this little old tiny Honda car we bought. Paid like $3,000 for it. It's the kind of car that you used to have to lay hands on. You know what I mean? And just pray for it. Start. You, charismatics, you understand exactly. You, you know where I'm coming from with that. And we got, we came into this city and the city we lived in, Versailles, and, and there was this roundabout. Now they have them in Orlando now, but this is 30 years ago. I'd never seen a roundabout in my life. So all these cars are in and out of this circle. And I come up to it and I didn't know what to do. And the people behind me are honking, laying on the horn. And I didn't learn a lot of, know a lot of French, but I learned some cuss words real quick. In fact, here's something else I found out. All over the world, there's an international symbol that means get out of the way. It's an appendage on a, fing- a finger. And... Um, I learned very quickly in about two days. You yield to the right. Just yield to the right. Then you can go. Here's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Go. Do your business. Just yield to me. It's a heart position. I think if the Holy Spirit could ask you a question today, I believe you would ask this. Will you let me lead? Will you give me that place in my life. It's a daily prayer of surrender. The opposite of that is resistance. The opposite of that is I'm not going to make room for you. Now please, please don't minimize the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't turn it into well, I'm going to walk into my closet and Holy Spirit you just show me which clothes to wear today. That's just dumb. Just wear clothes that match, okay? And that fit. That's, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. Holy Spirit, will you lead me today? It's a dangerous prayer to pray. When you say, Holy Spirit, lead me, watch out. Doors are going to open that you can't open. Doors are going to close that you can't close. Friends that you should have gotten rid of a long time ago are going to be leaving you new friends are going to be added opportunities are going to come others are going to shut it's a dangerous prayer to pray Holy Spirit lead me today let me pray for you Father I thank you for every person here today Father we're getting ready to make a daily life decision because you're asking us the question will, will you let me lead it's a decision time for so many of us Father And Lord, we're at that point where we're saying, Lord, we want you to lead us. Holy Spirit, will you lead? First of all, Lord, forgive us if if we just embraced you, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, and we left the Holy Spirit out of our life. We're saying, Holy Spirit, we want you to come. Come, Holy Spirit. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we're asking your voice to be strong in our life. We're making the commitment today that we're not going to be like the church of Ephesus where we quench the Holy Spirit, or the Thessalonians where we quench the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be the church that resisted the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be the group of people that ignores you. Holy Spirit, we want you. And if it requires us to say, less of us and more of you we're willing to do that Lord if it requires us to adjust some things in our life we're willing to do that Lord so Holy Spirit today we make the adjustment and the prayer is this we will yield we will make room we will say come Holy Spirit in response to your question Lord Will you let me lead? 
our answer is, yes, Lord, I will let you lead my life. Holy Spirit, I need you. In Jesus' name, and let God just speak to you right where you are. Just let him speak to you. Just a real holy moment with no one moving, please. God's talking to people right now. adjustments you make on the inside. Simple adjustments.